So thanks everybody uh, for the invitation. Thanks Renzo for the introduction. As I said, it's a pleasure for me to speak at this seminar because I was a member of University of Milan during my masters and I see a lot of names that I remember <laughs> and it would be very nice to see all these people in person but I'm happy to you know, see you virtually. Um, so I would like today to talk about IIT, but with a slightly different spin. Uh, some of you may know that IIT has been around for a while now, and it's been trying to study consciousness scientifically from a uh, peculiar perspective. Um, as I said in the abstract, there are mainly, I think, two important um, topics that uh, people doing research in consciousness try usually to address. One is really studying the quantity or, or level of consciousness in the sense of when it's there, when it's not there, how it appears in the morning when we wake up, how it fades away when we fall in a dreamless sleep or when we are under anesthesia. But then philosophers on the other side are more interested in the, in the quality of experience, meaning on the phenomenal content, the subjective character of consciousness. And IIT um, for a long time has been focused on talking about the quantity, so measuring the level of consciousness, but in very recent years, basically in the past three years, uh, started this process of coming out and uh, showed that we can, or at least it's promising, we might be able to study the quality of experience scientifically. So today I would like to talk, you, to talk about that um, and tell you something about IIT in general, so how the methodology of IIT uh, attempts to go from experience to its physical substrate, then I would like to briefly tell you what IIT um, has to say about the quantity of consciousness, give you an example of how to study qualia scientifically, in particular I will focus on the first example of a, of a work that has been published uh, in 2019 about the quality of, of visual space, and then I will conclude briefly with something about the in-progress work and the future work. So, uh, I would like to start with a cheesy and, and mildly unrelated quote and, and out of uh, context quote. Um, as we all know, Juliet in Romeo and Juliet said to Romeo, uh, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And in a sense, this can be inappropriately used to define the problem of consciousness. It doesn't matter what we call our, uh, our experiences, it doesn't even matter what we do with them uh, if we decide to fight a war, you know, uh, in, name, uh, in the name of, of some, I don't know, pride or some family heritage. What matters is really how experience feels like, what it feels like to have an experience. And this can be used, and has been used, I think, to define the real problem of consciousness that science is trying to tackle. Famously, Chalmers um, named this the hard problem of consciousness to distinguish it from the easy problems, which are the ones susceptible to standard methods of cognitive science. So we could try to explain cognitive access, attention, control of behavior, memory, everything that goes under the um, category or the label of the mind or cognitive processes. And we have a pretty good idea how to do this in cognitive neuroscience by now. Um, but the real problem, according to Chalmers, and now according also to many scientists, is really explaining why the performance of a bunch of cognitive functions should be accompanied by experience. So why there is something it is like to be a human being that performs some control of behavior or retrieves a memory and something like that. So in the past, maybe 30 years now, um, the Neuroscience of consciousness, of course, made giant leaps. It was started the, uh, with the whole paradigm of uh, searching for the neural correlates of consciousness in the 90s by Francis Crick and Christoph Koch. And we came a long way understanding how an experience of something in the external world is correlated with something happening inside the brain. It can be patterns of activity, it can be neural synchrony between areas. Uh, we can have different ideas, different hypotheses of what the neural correlates of consciousness are. But people agree that this is still not the full explanation. What we are missing is the fact that those neural correlates correlate with experience. So we really feel something when we are looking at a dog. And that's what we have to explain if we want a complete theory of consciousness. 
The problem is that if we start from physics and functions and how the brain works, we have an explanatory gap. We can't really explain why there should be something it is like to have those brain processes in our, in our head. So the perspective of IIT is slightly different. Um, the intuition is that what we really have to do is not start from our best guesses on uh, what neural process could be important for consciousness and then try somehow to squeeze consciousness out of it, but it is actually to start from our own experience with introspection and uh, phenomenology and we can try to find the properties that seem to be crucial, that seem to be necessary for experience and then make an inference about uh, the properties of the brain that are important so that then we can go into the world and instead of reading other people's minds and trying to guess if they are conscious or not, we can just look at their brain and uh, measure the relevant properties. So for IIT, even neuroscience in a sense starts from experience. We are, in this case, let's say, a Cartesian subject who thinks and therefore who is. Um, we exist, we experience something, and among all the things that we experience, we find some regularities. We open our eyes and we see an external world. We look at uh, the apple on the chair in this case, and uh, every time we close our eyes and we open the eyes, the apple is still there. Um, we find these regularities, and uh, I'm cutting through, of course, uh, millennia of history of philosophy, but we have a uh, good reason to make an inference that there is an external world made of objects that are independent from us, and among these various objects, we have come to discover that there is a special object, which is the brain, which seems to be particularly important because we see it as an external object, so to speak, if I were looking at my brain in, a, in, a, in an fMRI or something like that, and we find a correlation between the states of the brain and the states of our experience, the properties of our experience and the properties of the brain. So the idea is that this special object can be scientifically investigated, but we have to start from our own experience to make some guesses of what properties in the brain are crucial for experience, because in a sense we have no idea if we don't start from our own experience. The problem is that for many years now, uh, philosophers again and scientists have realized that there is no direct, there seems to be no direct correspondence between consciousness and some specific um, properties of the brain, so the brain intended as, as really the physical substrate, so there is no neuron that is crucial for consciousness in the sense that consciousness is in there, there's no little monad like Leibniz at a certain point proposed that is the dominant monad and contains the soul. Um, there is no pattern of activity that is necessarily there when consciousness is there and uh, it, um, it is also sufficient for consciousness. So what IIT tries to do is to take a different route and to think that, well, maybe we shouldn't look at the brain as it is. We should really understand the brain as a physical system who has parts, and these parts causally constrain each other. So the idea, if we have to unfold the full set of causal powers of the brain and the way in which its mechanisms interact with each other, then maybe we can find a correspondence between this complicated way in which the brain uh, causally affects itself and our experience. And there is a reason why this is an interesting hypothesis. And the reason is that it is an hypothesis that starts from experience. Um, before jumping into that and explaining to you why, uh, what, what is basically the, the idea, what are the properties that for uh, IIT um, we should use and we can identify in experience to um, find the neural correlates of consciousness or even more the physical substrate of consciousness, I just want to go back to the idea that a theory of consciousness, if it's right, should tell us two things. Should allow us to find some properties that characterize every experience and these properties should be translatable into physical properties of the substrate that allow us to discriminate, for instance, um, a state in which a subject is asleep and therefore, let's say, mostly unconscious uh, or very, very, very little consciousness um, from a state in which a, subs um, a subject is um, aware and conscious or maybe they are dreaming from a state in which a subject is unconscious because under anesthesia 
or because uh, affected by any of the disorders of consciousness that the coma uh, literature uh, has been talking about. And uh, according to IIT, there are five properties we can use from experience to infer the physical properties that allow us to discriminate between the presence or absence of consciousness. The second thing, though, that I mentioned at the beginning is that a theory of consciousness should also tell us that the properties of experience in the sense of the fact that I am seeing something like the vast expanse of the dark sky or that I'm listening to music and I'm perceiving flow in time or movement, that I'm seeing faces rather than letters and characters, that I'm seeing color or feeling pain, all these kind of contents of experience should also be explainable based on the properties of the physical substrate of consciousness. So a theory should do both, should, do, should tell us something about the quantity of experience but also about the quality. So if we start from the idea of the quantity, which has been what IIT has been talking about for mostly 30 years now, um, we can actually go beyond what Descartes said uh, and realize that not only our experience exists and it is uh, beyond doubt, because if I doubt I confirm that I'm at least conscious and having an experience because I'm thinking, there are other properties that can be singled out um, with introspection and that are um, essential. So the idea here really is that each of these properties is true of every conceivable experience, not only the experiences that everybody ever had, but of every conceivable experience and potentially also non-human experiences, of course. So the first property is intrinsicality. And this really is, is not, not new in the sense that in the history of philosophy, many people, as I mentioned, Descartes, Leibniz, Kant, other, other philosophers realized that experience is subjective. It is from a point of view. It is intrinsic in the sense that it doesn't really matter what happens in the external world my experience could be completely disconnected from the external world if I were dreaming or if I were in a sensory deprivation tank, I would still have an experience and um, of course provided that my brain works works well. So the idea is that for experience there is a subject and the experience is for the subject, it is intrinsic. Um, this is represented by having you know a point of view, imagine you are lying on a bed um, you're looking at uh, a scene outside of the window, experiences for yourself, it's not for somebody else. If it was for somebody else, then you would be that somebody else, it would be their experience. Um, and it is, um, again, from a specific point of view. So the first question of IIT is how do we translate this apparently ephemeral property into physical terms? How do we do science with this? Well, the idea is that we now know that some mechanisms in the brain are responsible for the um, generation of this experience. At least when some properties in the brain are ca being carried on, then there is an experience. And the idea is that the intrinsicality of experience, um, the hypothesis is, might correspond to the fact that some mechanisms in the brain are able to causally constrain their own states intrinsically, meaning independently from something that happens outside of the system. So the idea is that there is a, um, a part of the brain, at least not necessarily the whole brain, uh, which is able to causally constrain itself maximally in a way that creates, so to speak, a system. Like there is a way in which I am a subject and uh, uh, I'm an individual, so to speak, uh, a conscious subject in, in the same sense. So for IIT, um, we can check how this um, intrinsicality is implemented in a system or whether a system satisfies intrinsicality in the following way. Um, imagine this is a very simplified, I don't know, little piece of the brain in posterior cortex. Um, we have some units and these units have connection between, between each other. They have self-connection with themselves and they can be in two states, either off, in this case, it's represented in, uh, with a, in white, or they are uh, on, represented in, uh, in blue, with a blue feeling, which means that a unit is either firing or not firing. Um, well, to check for intrinsicality, the idea is that we take 
a mechanism, in this case B, and we check what is the main cause of B being in state off. So we can ask ourselves, if I know that B is in state off, which is the um, mechanism uh, upon which the majority of information, the highest information is specified? So I can say that since the self-connection of, of B is the strongest connection in this case, the fact that B is off really tells me that the cause of B being in state off was that B was off, just uh, the type step before. So we can say that the cause of B, this is called a cause purview in IIT, is that B was off. So we can do the same thing for the effect of B. We can ask ourselves, what is uh, the maximal constraint that B is having upon another element? And we can answer this question by saying, well, B was off and therefore it will be off. And therefore the, the maximum effect that B is having is over itself being off in the future. So this is what we call in IIT a distinction in physical terms. Um, which corresponds, roughly speaking, to a distinction in phenomenal terms. Um, in the same way in which in phenomenology we can distinguish components of our experience, there must be some mechanism in the physical substrate that is specifying information about other mechanisms within the, the system, meaning intrinsically. Um, and um, this mechanism, if it constrains something within the system, we can call it a distinction. So. This is the idea of intrinsicality, but of course there's much more to experience than just being a subject, right? One of the main things that uh, some other philosophers, of course, have uh, recognized is that our experience is structured. There is always um, a lot of content of experience. Uh, for instance, again, going back to our example, in my experience, when I wake up from a nap and I look at this, um, this uh, scene, I can distinguish the left and the right uh, side of my visual field. I can see my body. I see a book. I see it is blue. I see there is a blue book. <laughs> I see green outside of the window. I see grass. All these things are components of our experience. I could have an experience with vision and sound. Uh, I might be smelling the, the, the smell of tea that I just brewed uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that like experience is structured, the physical substrate of experience and the cause effect structure that he specifies is structured too. Which means it's really all these mechanisms that um, specify the cause effect structure um, are specifying a structure of causes and effects and relations between them. And the idea of IIT is that in informational terms, we might have to resort, and actually most of the time we should resort, to higher order mechanisms. If we have only four units in our system, we should really check how even um, pairs of units or sets of three units or four units are causally constraining the system together rather than individually. And as you can guess, of course, this makes IIT a non-reductionist uh, theory in causal terms. And I can tell you why this is the case, because for instance, it might turn, turn out to be the case that if we take a mechanism um, constituted of two units, for instance, AC in this case, um, the mechanism AC has a cause, again, it tells us a lot about the state of AB in the past, and it has an effect, it causally constrains the state of B in the future, uh, in a way that is irreducible to the information that is specified by A and C individually. So we call this a higher order distinction. And I know that a lot of people probably already uh, may raise eyebrows uh, based on the fact that IIT talks about higher order mechanisms, but there is a clear, interesting and uh, measurable way to um, assess whether a mechanism is higher order or not. So in this case, I'm using a different example. This is a little technical, so pardon the, the, the technicalities, but it, it's really not, not complicated. Um, so uh, consider the situation in which we have four units, in this case, A, B, C, D, and C is, a, is an XNOR gate, which means that C turns on if and only if A and B are both either off or on. Well, if we consider the information that C alone is specifying about AB, given that C is on, what we can say about the state of AB 
is only that they are either both off or both on. So from the intrinsic point of view of C, so to speak, there is really no way to tell whether A, B are on or off. C is just saying that A, B are in the same state. But if we have um, another uh, mechanism, which is in this case D, uh, which is a copy, uh, meaning that it turns on whenever B is on and it turns off whenever B is off, D specifies information about the state of uh, B and uh, knows, so to speak, again metaphorically, that B is going to be off, uh, where well, it was off in the past because D is on. Sorry, it was on, uh, it was on because D is on. So if we now ask the question, what C and D uh, say together about the state of AB, well, we have an answer that is not reducible to the individual answers of the two units, meaning that C, D together uh, will say that not only uh, they, A and B, were either off or on, but they were both on, because the two units together specify something that is uh, information that is uh, more specific uh, with respect to the one of the two units separately. This is not true for every mechanism though, and this is very important. IIT doesn't just proliferate mechanisms uh, without necessity, uh, it doesn't say that any mechanism is irreducible, because some mechanisms are reducible. For instance, if C were an end gate, C would already alone causally constrain A and B uh, in basically being in the on-on state. So in this case, D, knowing that D was on, um, wouldn't really add anything to the information that the C node specified. So in this case, we wouldn't have a mechanism, a higher order mechanism CD, uh, if C is an end, but we would have a higher order mechanism CD if C is an X nor. Um, so we would have to do this, of course, for any sorts of mechanisms in the system. And the idea of IIT is that really this corresponds to the fact that in our experience, anything really um, can uh, constitute a subset of uh, our experience. And uh, here the idea is that the complexity of experience must be explainable in terms of something very rich in the physical substrate. We would have to check, of course, for second order distinctions, and we would have to um, make sure that the causes and effects that the distinctions in this case uh, specify um, also um, interact with each other. Um, so in IIT terms, these are called causal relations. I'm trying to show you how a cause effect structure is built uh, step by step and piece by piece, and I know I'm skipping a lot of steps, but I hope this gives you the idea of what really IIT is trying to do in the process of studying the physical substrate of experience um, by unfolding uh, the, the full set of cause effect powers. So, um, so the idea is that when we have different distinctions that specify causes and effects, um, occasionally these causes and effects might overlap. We might have two distinctions, for instance in this case B and AC, that both specify an effect over B, which means that two mechanisms, one first order mechanism B and one second order mechanism AC, are specifying, are causally constraining are having both an effect on node B. And this in causal terms might result in a joint interaction between these two mechanisms and in a joint causal constraint. So these joint causal constraints in IIT are called relations. We can have two relations whenever two mechanisms have a cause or an effect or two effects over the same unit. And we can have also three relations, which means we can have um, two or more mechanisms specifying causes or effects over the same unit, but in this case uh, with three, um, uh, again, three causes or effects uh, jointly constraining the same unit. And this is called a three relation. So now we have <laughs> basically all the elements to say what the point of IIT is in unfolding uh, the physical substrate, at least for what it pertains to composition, um, and the idea is that for each individual element um, we have to check the causes and effects of that specific mechanism. We also have to check the causes and effects um, of each pair of mechanisms, 
because the pair of mechanisms might be irreducible in the information that spec they specify about other mechanisms. We also have to check, of course, triplets of mechanisms, and also we have to check four um, uh, well, uh, quadruplets of mechanisms, and so on and so forth, if the system um, was bigger. So the idea is that once we do all these computations, and uh, in physical terms, this would require, of course, to perturb and observe each individual subset of neurons in, a, in, in the brain, um, then we can build this interesting uh, representation of the full set of causal powers of a system, which in IIT is called a cause effect structure. So we also know that experience doesn't just have components, it's not just structured, but it is also very specific. For instance, right now I'm having an experience, as I said, of a blue book, a bed, and uh, a landscape outside of the window, but I could be having an experience of a different scene. For instance, if I'm watching a movie, pretty much any individual frame is a different experience with dramatically different uh, components. So. Uh, in IIT terms, this can be translated into, again, physical cause-effect power of the substrate of experience by checking the difference between um, the substrate of experience being in a specific state, in this case C being on and A, B and D being off, or a different state, um, for instance, when uh, everybody is off. And in this case, unfolding the cause effect structure of the same, the very same system with the very same connections, but different states, yields different results. In this case, we would have a different set of causes and effects because the units being in state or on or off um, causally constrain the system in different ways. And the idea of IIT is that this is what, in physical terms, gives us really the specificity of every experience. The fact that I am seeing a, a book or I am uh, hearing a sound, the state change is what corresponds um, in the brain to changes in its substrate. And this is not, not a mystery, actually. Um, a fourth property that is very important is that experience is integrated. Um, this has been pointed out by many people, like especially Kant, so many philosophers, especially Kant, the idea is that every experience is really for me as a subject of experience, but it is also unified. It doesn't make any sense to think that I might be having two experiences if we understand, of course, experience as the whole state of consciousness. Um, you can imagine, for instance, asking the question, could it be that um, there is an experience of the left half of my visual field that has absolutely no relation and it is not co-experienced to the experience of, of the right uh, side of my visual field. And well, if that were the case, then there would be two subjects of experience. And of course, this might remind you of cases um, or at least interpretations of uh, what happens to consciousness in split brain patients. Um, in physical terms, uh, this corresponds to the fact that since experience is unified, the substrate of experience must also be unified. Which means that if we were to cut the substrate of experience in any possible way, make really the minimal partition that would make the minimal effect, we would always find a major effect in the cause of structure, so we would dramatically affect the, um, the cause effect power uh, specified by the system if the system is integrated. So one check for integration in IIT is to try to cut in any possible way the substrate of experience and observe that there is no partition that makes absolutely no difference to the system. This is what this is really what means that the system is integrated. If I were to have a system that I can cut in half and nothing would happen, then I would have two systems. I wouldn't have one system. And the last um, property of experience that is interesting and important um, is the property of exclusion. Uh, there is a lot of talk in philosophy about the combination problem and about uh, the, the, the problem of defining why I am a subject of experience and I'm not having an experience of more. For instance, uh, I am a subject of experience but me, a system constituted of me plus my phone, is not a subject of experience, or at least it doesn't seem like it. Um, 
but also the question of why I am a subject of experience and it seems like most part of my brain is crucial for me having the experience I'm having rather than just a subset of it. Um, I am having both visual uh, experiences and auditory experiences. Uh, there seems to be no subject that is only having a visual experience and another one only having the, an auditory experience. And this is, uh, in IIT terms, is defined as um, uh, exclusion, the idea that experience is definite, it has the borders it has, and it includes what it includes. For instance, I'm not my visual field has a, a size, it, there's something outside of it, but I'm not experiencing it. And of course, um, the same goes for uh, somewhere in my brain, the blood pressure uh, that I'm having in this moment is definitely encoded, but I don't have, uh, most of the time at least, um, I don't have an experience related to my blood pressure in this moment. So there is something that is in and something that is out. And the idea again in IIT is that if we take the physical substrate um, of experience, there must be a reason why it is exactly constituted by the units um, which it is constituted of, rather than more units or less units. So in IIT, if we were to include extra units, in this case I, which is a mere input unit, let's say a neuron, I don't know, in, in the retina or in LGN, um, or if we were to cut out a unit like A, we would see that the, these systems might still specify cause effect structures, um, but overall the amount of information and the, the amount of cause of constraints that the system is specifying about its own mechanisms would always decrease. So the idea of exclusion is that really the substrate of consciousness that exists and that is the real one is the one that exists the most in the sense that causally constrains itself the most. Okay, so um, in terms of quantity, this um, is grounding some predictions we can do about the level of integrated information, which in IIT is called phi, in states where the subject is conscious or states in which the sub subject is not conscious. And of course, as you, as you may be thinking, um, it is actually very complicated to unfold the full cause effect power of a system because we have to take First of all, not uh, four or eight units, we would have to take uh, billions of units. Um, and uh, we can't uh, just uh, analyze each individual neuron, uh, we would have to analyze all the subsets of neurons. So that would be very, very, very complicated computationally. So one question is, can't we just simplify in some sense? And well, I'm speaking to a crowd that is much, much more uh, uh, expert uh, than me on this issue. Well, there has been attempts to approximate the level of uh, integrated information using, for instance, the perturbation of complexity index, where the idea is really we can approximate integrated information by stimulating the brain with TMS and recording the response uh, with EEG in different states of consciousness, uh, in wakefulness, uh, dream, dreamless sleep, uh, REM sleep, and under anesthesia. And we can use basically compression algorithm to understand and approximate the level of integrated information that we would get if we were able to unfold the system in full, like I explained. And there, I'm not going to talk about that, but there, there's very good evidence that um, it is a very good approximation. So uh, high levels of PCI correspond to high levels of integrated information, meaning a big cause effect structure with a, a lot of phi, a high level of phi, Whereas like uh, low levels of PCI correspond to uh, low levels of integrated information and therefore low levels or, or, or no consciousness at all. So as I told you, um, there is a second uh, point which is very important, which is that we want to explain the quality of experience uh, besides the quantity. And I'm going to finish, uh, I hope in time, <laughs> by telling you that each of these contents of experience, uh, for instance, phenomenal space, phenomenal time, the idea that we can perceive faces and letters as invariants, um, meaning we have concepts of what faces are and what letters are that we can lose in uh, pathological conditions such as prosopagnosia, for instance, that we experience color and pain, 
The idea now of IIT is really to try and explain what are the features of the cause effect structure that might address these contents of experience. And we've had an example uh, published in 2019 of um, addressing phenomenal space conducted by Andrew Hahn. We have two more works in progress right now. One is by Renzo Comolatti, um, which is working with us in Madison and also in Milan, who is trying to uh, explain phenomenal time based on IIT. I am personally working on a project on phenomenal concepts and more projects are yet to come on color and pain. So um, I'm going to give you just one example of how IIT can explain the content of experience uh, for real. Like we take a quale and we try to explain it in physical terms. So imagine you are laying down looking at the starry sky and you see a vast expanse, even if you close your eyes, you still see darkness maybe, but you still, still see an extended canvas, so to speak, on which the stars or the colors or whatever you're looking at are projected or appear. This is true for vision, but it is not true for smell, for instance. If you lay down and you close your eyes, um, your, your uh, olfactory experience doesn't feel extended. You might feel a smell or not, but it doesn't feel extended. You can say this smell is to the right of the other smell. So there must be a reason why spatial experience, um, in the sense of the experience of visual space, feels the way it does. So imagine you are lying down and you are seeing something like a firework going out in the sky. And then the firework disappears and you can still focus your attention on that region of space that was there where the, the firework appeared. Well, um, all these regions of space where the fireworks appear and disappear, they were already there while you were looking at the dark sky. And even if there was no star, you would still you know, see the extendedness of this, the sky, so to speak, of the visual space. Um, uh, again, even if there was no content uh, such as a star or a light. So in IIT terms, we can explain this. We know that, of course, uh, it is very important for uh, visual experience, um, what goes on in visual cortex in the, in the occipital lobes. Um, and we also know that the architecture of visual uh, cortex is mostly grid-like, uh, in the sense that neurons are laterally connected uh, and also uh, have feedforward and feedback connections with different layers. So in IIT terms, we, we can take the architecture of visual cortex, we can simplify, of course, the model, unfold the cause of structure, and find the distinctions that compose the cause of structure and the relations between them. Um, as I mentioned in 2019, uh, Andrew Ho and Giulio Tononi published a paper where they tried to do the, uh, to go through the process of explaining why space feels extended based on the features of the cause of structure unfolded from a substrate such as a grid that could uh, easily uh, be um, a simplification of the architecture of visual cortex. And the idea, um, I will not go into the details, if you have more questions you can ask me later, is that there are at least four properties of visual experience and spots that we can um, isolate with our attention in visual experience that are reflected not in the relations between the units that compose the substrate, in this case a grid-like uh, neural architecture, but that are reflected in the way in which the, um, in which the distinctions, the causal distinctions, uh, relate to each other. So we have some mechanisms in grid-like substrates that specify causes and effects over other mechanisms, and we can give an interpretation of the relations of um, uh, overlap between two spots in our visual field, inclusion between one spot and, and another spot that are crucial to define what it, what it is like to experience space. Um, we can give an interpretation of these properties in causal terms. We don't find it at the level of the, of the substrate, but we do find it at the level of the cause-effect power specified by a substrate with this architecture. Um, so, since I'm uh, running kind of out of time, I would like to uh, conclude by saying that these computational analyses are 
interesting and uh, they are of course far away from the applications in, uh, in uh, real uh, experimental scenarios such as you know studying a real brain but there are um, predictions that can be made based on this kind of uh, computational analysis. You can find more in uh, the paper by Hon and Tononi. One such prediction is that different areas of the brain have uh, cause-effect structures that are um, characterized by distinctions that, in, uh, that basically satisfy these properties that I just mentioned of connection, fusion, inclusion that are crucial to define space and therefore can be used to explain um, why visual space feels extended. Um, some other architectures, such as the random connectivity, well, random not in the sense of, uh, just in the sense it's not grid-like connectivity that we find, for instance, in uh, prefrontal cortex, um, can be shown to have very different uh, properties if unfolded into a cause of extraction. We don't find any extendedness, any distinctions that relate to each other uh, based on these properties of connection, fusion, inclusion, um, um, and reflexivity uh, in, uh, if we consider connectivity uh, such as the one we, we think is in, uh, in prefrontal cortex. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is a paper that is going to be uh, published uh, hopefully soon. Um, I'm going to conclude, uh, if you give me two more minutes. Hey, you can go a little bit over I mean, okay I good talk a little bit yeah uh, yeah okay um well so okay i'm going to tell you one thing about this paper uh based on the topic of space uh we recently submitted a paper to a specialist in neuroscience of consciousness where we tried uh, based on this very abstract uh computational uh, analysis to actually address an interesting question in philosophy which is and neuroscience which is the one of functionalism. Um, is functionalism, especially input-output functionalism, enough to explain consciousness? And well, based on what I just said about space, and let me recapitulate, basically the idea is that you have to unfold the full set of causal powers of a system and how each mechanism constrains each other in order to find a correspondence to what consciousness feels like, the experience specified by the sub that substrate, so the idea here is that um, the function that is performed by your system doesn't really matter for experience. What matters is the way in which the function is implemented and the set of causal powers that the system has. So what we've done in this paper, we have created a little system, which just it's just like a little eye that looks at uh, an empty screen. In this case, imagine the eye at time zero was fixating this point on the left and then a spot, like a bright dot, appears somewhere in the visual field of this uh, artificial eye. Um, this uh, bright spot, uh, the array of light, uh, basically hits one of the sensors of the retina of the eye, and the eye activates some motor such that the eye can fixate the bright dot. So we created this system, and we made two versions of it. One is a system with a grid layer in uh, its brain. The other one is a system with a map layer in its brain. And the difference between a grid and a map is that a map doesn't have lateral connections, uh, whereas like a grid does have lateral connections. So this is reminiscent, of course, a highly simplified, <laughs> just a proof of concept of something that could be said of different systems in the brain. We know that there are different cortical pathways uh, and subcortical pathways that um, mediate a function such as uh, ocular fixation. And in this case, we know that the cortical pathways described in blue here are largely grid-like. So there are lateral connections in each layer of, of these cortices. Whereas like the subcortical part pathways are more like maps. There are no lateral connections, but the, um, the pathway is able to basically initiate the same action such as ocular fixation. So what we've shown in this paper is that the two systems are functionally equivalent, trust me, they perform very well um, at the same task, uh, but interestingly, if you unfold the map, you find that the map specifies a very simple cause of extraction with actually seven separate cause of extraction that are not integrated, whereas like the grid specifies 
a big and interesting and complex cause effect structure. And if you compare the uh, evolution in time of these two systems when they are uh, performing their function, then you see that in IIT terms, um, the explanation is very different. They do perform the same function, but unfolding the cause effect power of both systems show that the map is not a system in the first place. And second, doesn't really specify a complex cause effect structure with relations that are able to tell you that there are spatial relations between these uh, the locations that each individual node is uh, encoding or it's coding for. Whereas like in the grid, we have a complex cause effect structure with higher order mechanisms and um, really some spatial properties. For instance, we can define neighborhood based on the causal relations between the, um, the mechanisms rather than just uh, using our external uh, observer perspective on the system and noticing that from the outside node A and node B are close to each other. That is not an intrinsic property of the system. I can't say more about this, but that was just to tell you <laughs> something that is uh, coming out pretty soon. Okay, now I'm going to conclude for real. Um, these different contents of experience are based on our introspection and our analysis of phenomenology first. So we do introspect, we do try to characterize consciousness and its content in detail, and then we use our best guess on the neural substrate of that specific content of consciousness to explain it. As I said, um, it makes sense, these are predictions, but what we know from neuroscience is that it makes a lot of sense that posterior areas such as occipital cortex and visual cortex have grid-like architectures, and that is not a mystery <laughs> that this type of architecture can actually um, uh, correspond to an experience of extendedness, precisely because we have shown that spatial properties can be found in the set of causes and effects and their relations if we unfold the causal powers of the system. There are other grid-like areas, of course. For instance, if we consider somatosensory cortex, um, we, uh, from phenomenology, can also make an interesting guess, which is, well, there is, in our experience, extendedness, not only in the visual, uh, in the experience of visual space, but also in the experience of the body. Um, so, again, uh, it is an interesting guess, and it can be tested, it can be, uh, um, it can inform uh, neuroscientific predictions, that other grid-like areas might um, have the same architecture, might be unfolded in the same cause of structure with similar properties, such as the property of extendedness, regardless of whether we're talking about visual space or body space. Uh, we also know something else about other parts of the brain, and uh, this is why I think, honestly, as a philosopher and as a, as a uh, <laughs> newborn uh, uh, sort of computational neuroscientist, I find very interesting the approach of IIT. We can use what we know about, um, about architectures in the brain to make predictions about the content of experience that might be uh, specified or contributed to by those areas of the brain. We know that in um, areas such as, for instance, um, associative areas, parietal areas, and uh, uh, in places like uh, FFA, um, the connectivity is not only grids, but it is actually stacks of grids, pyramids of grids. So we have layers with lateral connectivity and we have multiple layers stacked on top of each other. And the, the hypothesis of IIT is that this connectivity is the one that is important to define phenomenal concepts. Again, the fact that we can see a face and that we can recognize that face as being, you know, the face of Jennifer Aniston, regardless of where she is, what hairstyle she has, what, you know, face expression she's having. Um, and this idea is actually supported by what we know about the cortex. At least 38% of the cerebral cortex is made of uh, pyramids of grids. And uh, uh, of course, uh, especially Julius Noni spent uh, a long time trying to understand how the different substrates in the brain unfolded into cause of structure um, can uh, address the specific quality of the content of experience that we know are associated 
uh, with the activity of those areas and also of course also to uh, that are lost when we lesion those areas so here is territory that is of course we're still in the realm of, of wild guesses but they are not so wild wilder guesses are the ones about other contents of experience for instance what about color well as we said um in visual cortex, yes, there are grids, but there's also a lot of other <laughs> neurons. And we know that each individual grid is actually made of a lot of neurons. And we know that in specific layers, for instance, in B2, B3, uh, we have um, mini columns and we have double opponent cells. And we know that those uh, neurons are uh, important for the perception of color and low level qualities uh, in visual experience. So the idea of IIT, and again here, it is a wild guess, we have no idea, this is a testable hypothesis, we have to do the research, is to consider each individual mini column in the relevant areas and uh, check whether there is a structural similarity between the cause effect power of the unfolded little clicks of neurons in each individual location in the visual space that contribute each individual location in visual space and the experience of color in that specific location in the visual space. There are experiments that can be designed. Um, this, is a, this is work in progress. Another wild guess is um, a little trickier, and it's the one of, uh, well, we know that we experience time and movement. Uh, based on what we know about uh, cause effect structures of unfolded grids, we might imagine, uh, we actually suspect that a reasonable neural substrate, neural architecture for the experience of time are directed grids, meaning grids in which the lateral connections have a, a preferential direction. And as I said, Renzo is working on a project on this, trying to unfold um, the cause of structure of directed grids. But there is another interesting prediction, which is where, if at all, will we find in the brain directed grids? Nobody really knows what is the um, what are the specific uh, neural correlates of the experience of time. But we know that um, in auditory cortex and, the, and in MT, for instance, V5, uh, these areas are important for the perception of movement in the case of uh, HMT. And they are important uh, in our experience um, for the experience of a sequence. Uh, for instance, when we listen to music, uh, that is a paradigmatic example of something that flows in time. So this is a wild guess again, but it is uh, an interesting prediction. Then we have more uh, uh, obscure uh, contents of experience like pain, for which we don't even we are not even sure what exactly the substrate of experience might be. Uh, but there is interesting research to be done, especially on the phenomenology side, and then to translate it into uh, the language of uh, cause effect structures. Okay. So I'm done. Um, I want to go back to the cheesy quote and just say that um, I think the question what's in a quale that has been philosophical for a long time can be addressed scientifically in at least various theories, uh, among which I think IIT is the, one of the most interesting ones, are trying to do this by connecting phenomenology to the properties of the physical substrate. But the important thing is really that we should focus on how space-time concept colors feel because even if we were to call them differently or even if we were to consider uh, the functions that come with them uh, really they would feel just the same and that's really what we have to explain so that's it thank you thank you very much Matteo that was great um, now we will open for questions and answers uh, Matteo unless you want to do like a super quick break I actually, I'm okay going straight into questions, if that's okay for you. I'll just take a sip of, you know, water. But... So people can maybe raise hands or send through the chat. We, we as students are want to encourage like uh, other students to go ahead and ask questions because I mean, IT for someone who has never heard about it is a lot of information at once when you first hear. So please ask any questions you feel like you have. Let me see if I can. 
I think Andrea is raising a hand. Ciao. Ciao Andrea. Uh, you can see the hands being raised. Uh, no, I was raising my hands in the <laughs> 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 I have a, actually a very naive question. Because if you could you come back with the, the previous slide, please. This one? Yeah, with the predictions here. In all these cases, how can I say? You you can identify a structure in the experience. I mean, visually, uh, somatosensory experience, time. Uh, color, but what about fear, for example? Yes, so this is a very... Uh, more, more abstract experience, I mean, and more intrinsic experience, because yeah. not, not associated with, this, with the external world. Yeah, thanks. This is a very interesting question. Um, actually, there is one example here, which is the one of color that already raises the problem that you are talking about. I think it is no mystery that, and by not my chance, that philosophers used color uh, for a long time as a paradigmatic uh, case of a quale, because it seems like color is a perfectly simple experience. We cannot dissect the redness of red. Um, we can talk about space and we can talk about concepts and objects by uh, referring to their components, but we cannot talk about color um, based on internal structure. And the answer to the question is a little long and complicated. Um, I can, I will try to answer, I think a much better job is given, is, is done in, uh, in uh, the space paper that I mentioned by Hon and Tononi. Um, and also in uh, a paper that is called um, Consciousness is a Structure, not a Function, that will, is again uh, coming out in, uh, in, in, the next, uh, in the next year. Um, so, the idea is that the fact that experience is not, um, doesn't look like it is structured, doesn't necessarily mean that it is not structured. Uh, there are similarities between different colors and maybe between different emotions, um, and these similarities or the dis differences between different colors or different emotions must be due to something. Um, the idea of IIT is that we can introspect our own contents of experience, but of course our introspection is mediated by attentional mechanisms. In the case of space, for instance, we can use mechanisms that are fairly well known, the mechanisms of attention, where there is some top-down um, uh, increase of the uh, excitability of some neurons and therefore we are actually, so to speak, focusing the spotlight of attention on some regions of space. These mechanisms that are present, for instance, in uh, visual cortex um, and in the architecture of, of grids and pyramids uh, might not be present internally to each individual click of colors. So, it is, this is where IIT gets to the interesting and, and, and complicated territory of um, using introspection, which is of course limited, to explain scientifically uh, something uh, that is accessible only through introspection. However, and it, this is a little wild and sci-fi, I think if we were to find, so first of all, if we were to find that the mechanisms of, uh, for instance, emotions, fear, or in this case, color lack those attentional mechanisms that allow us to direct our attention to the internal structure of these um, mechanisms. For instance, if internally to a single mini column or a single click of neurons, let's imagine we discover that that is what corresponds to experience of color in a, in a, a little uh, area of our visual field, if we were unable to endogenously excite only some of the neurons in a single click rather than others, we would either excite direct our attention to the whole set of neurons or, or, or to none of it, then this would be a first, uh, a first demonstration that um, the limit of introspection corresponds to a limit in the architecture uh, and in the mechanisms of attention. But we could design experiments in principle to artificially stimulate and perturb these mechanisms, such as the ones for fear and for color. And the prediction of IIT is that 
it should be possible at that point to experience the internal structure of color in a way that maybe is not possible using mere introspection. Um, of course, it might also not be true, and in that case, the specific prediction of IIT would be false, and this is very nice because it means that IIT is falsifiable. <laughs> but the idea is that there is an explanation based on the mechanisms of attention to answer uh, these um, concern that some contents of experience are less um, are less uh, uh, introspectable and less structured than others. I hope this answers your question at least at least in part. Definitely yes, and um, thank you for making such difficult argument very easy. Thank you. Um, Francesco Luciano. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you, you said that this framework is not ready for uh, an experimental application, if I did understand. So I was wondering, what is the, the gap we have to fill uh, to make it experimental? I mean, is it a computational gap or is it a, a problem dealing with the quality of the experimental data we have to fit the model or I don't know, something else? Thanks for the question. Yes, I, I think I was um, probably, I, I was definitely oversimplifying when I said it, it's, it's not ready. It, it's much more complicated than that. So let me, see, let me say a few things. So first of all, in computational neuroscience, um, a lot of attempts to understand not only consciousness, but even cognition in general, rely on simplifications and models of uh, brain um, of, of, of brain connectivity. So uh, there is plenty of dynamical systems approaches to the brain. There is plenty of uh, approaches in terms of predictive processing and free energy. They all, there is somebody drawing on the screen, by the way, just in case I, I'm, I'm the only one noticing. Um, there are, uh, so these approaches, computational approaches to study not only conscious but cognition in general are, uh, I think, uh, on the rise. And they require simplification because we don't have the computational power right now to deal with huge numbers of units, meaning billions of, of, of neurons. However, there are approximations that can be used to um, address this question experimentally. I will uh, just mention a paper that is going to come out in the next year, hopefully by Tononi uh, and uh, Shuntaro Sasai. Uh, so keep an eye on that. If you're interested, send me an email. I can tell you more about that paper. Um, one thing that can be done in very practical terms is instead of trying to measure the activity of each individual neuron, which is, of course is completely impossible at, at, at the present time, and do the unfolding that IIT proposes, um, we've been working for uh, now five years on simplifications based on, uh, for instance, fMRI data. So one idea is to take uh, voxel uh, fMRI data and recordings of, let's say, a thousand voxels and do the IIT analysis, the IIT computations, based on, again, some assumptions, on that sort of rough uh, analysis of the activity of the brain. Going from, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of neurons to a thousand in the areas that we consider uh, crucial, but this is already an experimental uh, attempt to actually perform these computations um, on the real brain data. Uh, the second avenue, of course, is to try alternative approaches like the one that I mentioned of PCI. Instead of doing the complicated, instead of simplifying the data, let's say the acquisition is, um, is simplified, we just have uh, a thousand data points, and then what we do is that we do the computational analysis in full. We can do the opposite. We can simplify the computational analysis and just restrict it to, for instance, approximations of information and integration, um, but we can use real data such as fMRI, uh, sorry, TMS stimulation and EEG recording. Uh, so this is a different avenue that is uh, actually very promising because it is um, applicable in practice uh, at the bed of the patient. And here there's, of course, Marcello Massimini and other people working directly on this and, develop and, and developing um, PCI uh, to make it a clinical tool. And I think that is definitely a practical application of IIT that is promising and worth uh, keeping an eye on. I hope this is answered your question, but again, feel free to send me an email. I can tell you more about the literature. 
Thank you. Um, Quentin, do you want do you have a question? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Um, I have a question which I guess is pretty classical for people who are not very familiar with IIT, but uh, I'll go with it, I guess. Uh, does IIT predicts that the the brain has a causal complexity that can only be found in the brain, because if if uh, consciousness depends on causal complexity, and of course there is causal complexity everywhere, right? But so does IIT uh, predicts that consciousness depends on such kind of causal complexity that is really only that you can only find in brains, or does it on the or does it contrarily say that maybe there is consciousness like outside of brains, like in computers, for example, mm -hmm. or things like that? Thank you. Thank you. This is a great question. And uh, I'm glad you, you asked because this is definitely one of the most interesting philosophical aspects of IIT. So in the past 30 years, um, after the, the, the surge of, of physicalism, especially in philosophy of mind, and uh, and some uh, objections to physicalism that brought some people to defend various forms of dualism. In philosophy of mind, a lot of uh, philosophers started realizing that consciousness might actually be a very fundamental feature of reality. And in a sense, even every time we talk about physical reality, it's because we start by having an experience of the physical world. So the view of panpsychism in uh, philosophy of mind uh, has become very popular precisely because in a sense there is no reason why if we find a set of properties in the brain that support consciousness and these properties are not the presence of i don't know a specific um cyclone or a physical particle that we have detected uh, you know uh, with, with some physical tools but they are informational properties or computational properties or causal properties that are, as you say, uh, definable in terms of complexity, then there is no reason why if we found these properties instantiated in other systems, we wouldn't, uh, you know, be justified in claiming that those other systems are conscious. There is something it is like to be those systems. And IIT goes exactly this way. It says, well, <laughs> Of course, it's going to stay a guess. We do not know, but we will never know. So our best guess is that if we find some properties that are always systematically present in the brain when we are conscious um, and disappear when we are not, then what we can infer is that those properties are really the ones that uh, correspond to consciousness. We can use these properties, as I said, to adjudicate between uh, the presence or absence of consciousness in critical scenarios such as locked-in syndrome patients, vegetative state patients, coma patients, um, where we don't have direct access. Of course, we cannot just ask them if they are conscious or not, or even if we do, it's, it's complicated to interpret the answer. Um, but we could as well use these, um, this guess uh, to adjudicate uh, in terms of the presence or absence of consciousness in machines, artificial systems, non-human animals, and you name it. Um, the, your question had a, a, a maybe a second part. I, I don't know if you were also interested in that, but interestingly, IIT doesn't uh, simply rely on the uh, pre-theoretical assumption that consciousness is, is related to activity in the brain. Uh, IIT tries to find a principled answer to the question, where in the brain and why the brain? And why some parts of the brain? Why the thalamocortical system? Why posterior cortex rather than frontal? Why the uh, thalamocortical system rather than the cerebellum? The five axioms of IIT translated into the postulates try to answer these questions. Um, so the idea is that something like the cerebellum, even though it has even more neurons than uh, cerebral cortex, um, might actually, actually, the, the, the analysis of the architecture, modular and parallel, of the cerebellum shows that the level of integrated information in the cerebellum is very low and it is actually, it does not give rise to integrated systems. So this is a principled explanation of why damages to the cerebellum and, and getting rid entirely, like ablation of the cerebellum might have effects on behavior, the control of actions and movements and cognition, but it doesn't seem to affect consciousness. 
So I think the question of where in the brain consciousness is, so to speak, and where else in the universe consciousness might be, are related. And interestingly, IIT is trying to provide a scientific account, a scientific answer to both. I hope this helps. Thank you. I uh, see a question in the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah, Elena asked, what computational tool do you use in your research? Thanks, thanks. This is a very interesting question, and I, I'm actually very glad to talk about this. So um, we are using a package, a Python uh, package called PyFi. There is a publication, I think it's uh, 2018, I'm not entirely sure. Um, it is named uh, PyFi, a toolbox for computing integrated information, I think, by Will Maynard and Julius Anoni and other, um, other members of the lab. Um, and uh, it is on GitHub, it's um, open access, it is uh, free and it allows anybody with a computer to create little systems and compute integrated information and play with the cost of extraction that we're talking about. And I know that there are some labs now that are starting to use the same computational tools and apply them to their own uh, sets of, uh, well, in this case, uh, sometimes data, as I said, it's complicated to apply PyFi uh, to real data from brain imaging, but Definitely some computational scientists are uh, trying different architecture and different assumptions. For instance, some people are trying to compute um, integrated information uh, based on um, non-deterministic systems, non-binary units, different kinds of, uh, of assumptions about the uh, activation functions of the units and the connectivities. Uh, there has been an attempt by some members in the lab to apply this um, uh, computational analysis to uh, uh, yeast cells and uh, the cycle between uh, yeast cells, which is very interesting because again, it goes beyond the, the boundary of the brain. So um, the sky is the limit. <laughs> if anybody has uh, some experience with Python and wants to try to use PyFi to compute integrated information, it's available. And, uh, and I encourage you to do it because it is, I think, interesting and, and exciting. I think we're almost out of time, but I mean, if there's still any uh, questions I can bundle them and and ah yeah so Professor Giuliano Torengo has a question so maybe we can finish with his question and then I'll just remind before closing that we have two more seminars planned um, from this MBR series uh, the next one is the May 5th uh, by Anne Sophie Barwich she will talk about the neuroscience of smell It'll probably be very interesting the same time uh, five o'clock and then on the 19th of may we have matthias michel uh, with a talk on you don't know what you're missing consciousness prefrontal cortex and anosognosia uh, professor Giuliano. okay thanks uh, <laughs> um i was wondering whether um given that uh, um anyway the the the, the theory, the analysis uh, begins with the, with the introspection. Uh, whether there is, mm, is, I mean, whether the distinction between uh, what might seem to be representational uh, properties of uh, our states and non-representational properties, whether this distinction has any role in the theory. Uh, because like you mentioned, things like uh, uh, the, the visual field, no? And for instance, it looks like that uh, uh, things like the border of the visual field are, you no. Know, in some sense, we are aware of the border of the visual field. You no, know, we know more or less where they are. And, and uh, so it seems to be a part of uh, our awareness, but they are, it's quite difficult to imagine them as object of awareness in the sense of, uh, 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 no, the, whatever I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, is presented to me in my experience. Now, for instance, you know, I don't get surprised if by moving my hand, sorry, my uh, my head, uh, the borders moves with me, and, and and I just don't, you know, it's not that I am expecting that space is is <laughs> is no longer there if I move my head, right? So so it looks like that they they uh, uh, they 
they present themselves as a feature of experience itself rather than uh, of what this the, what the experience uh, represents so in a sense what could what could think that there are you know uh, those features that uh, uh, are feature of experience but are not representational in the sense that they 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 do not represent anything now we are aware of them mm. but they are not uh, uh, they, you know, they don't have they don't come with this uh, phenomenology of presenting us something uh, so, so just one one question because i'm not sure i understand when you say they don't represent anything um do you mean uh, they don't represent anything f in the external world or or not well or I, I mean i mean that they don't they don't come with this uh phenomenology of uh uh presenting us something uh, uh, yeah in the external world so, so oh, I, I have a visual experience of uh, of an apple you know, on the table you know? Uh, you know i have i can even if i introspect you no know, <laughs> i can still you know i still have uh, this uh, experience of something out there okay yeah, uh, yeah. i am um you know, I'm I'm aware of the border of my visual field, uh, but they don't appear to me as the objects within the the visual field. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, appears to me, right? So, they I'm aware of it, I, and definitely some sort of like phenomenal and and awareness. But they they don't have the same those features. Don't they don't seem to have the same status? Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, this, as I said, maybe maybe the maybe the distinction which is not really important in the theory, but I've always been curious about whether it is. No, no, I think this is very interesting. That there's many many things to say. Um, let me say, uh, well, a bold statement is that uh, I think, uh, from a philosophical point of view, IIT is a purely internalist view and non-representational view, in the sense that um, it is internalist because literally. It doesn't matter what the state of the units in the rest of the universe is, uh, the experience is defined by the set of units um, constituting the substrate of consciousness. This is, of course, based on the fact that we know that you can be completely isolated from the environment, you can dream, you can have any, uh, sub, any, any content of consciousness, um, and it is just due to what's actually going on in the substrate of experience. Um, and the representation side is that, again, for IAT, since consciousness, since phenomenology has this, this primacy, everything is postulated, even the existence of a physical world in a, in a certain sense is postulated from within phenomenology, um, any meaning that any experience or content of experience has is qualitative, is phenomenal. So the idea is that my experience of the apple represents an apple that in the, is in the external world. I mean, of course, there is a causal chain of events that goes from a system in the external world that causes the effects, uh, the physical substrate of experience, and that sets it in a state that is experiencing an apple. But in principle, <laughs> I could create a brain organi organoid in a slab give it exactly the same yeah. state and exactly the same connectivity so, but just to be clear the, the difference that i mentioned that i'm mentioning is uh, i mean I, I i call it the representational representational features and non-representational features but it's not about the the, the philosophy in the sense of the uh, right right what constitute the experience so right right right, right. right. See, it's not like things. direct realism or anything yes yes yeah yes. no no it's not a problem of uh, what constitute the experience so i'm let's uh, be on board with the purely internalist picture yep. perfectly fine there is this phenomena, oh. phenomenological dif difference between <laughs> certain properties that that uh, appear to us as if uh, they present us something out there and others that don't. I mean, so, for instance, the after images are another one that they, they are often, yes. uh, often mentioned you know, as no representation in the sense, you no, know, because we cannot go around an after image. You know, so they, they don't <laughs> look like <laughs> things out there. You know? But yes. more, more interesting the border of the of the visual field uh, uh, same uh, similar anyway sorry right no one one quick comment on the the second part of of the question was um i think exactly uh, regardless of the question about the external world i think it is very interesting what you ask because there is a way in principle at least to answer these questions that you posed uh, with the tools of iit for instance if we were to unfold the cause effect structure based on grid-like substrate uh, substrate in visual cortex as i mentioned 
we find some properties that are um, the fact that we can define topological properties of connection inclusion between spots between regions in the visual field we can define in terms of intrinsic uh, cause effect power and therefore uh, we can translate the properties from uh, experience of the distance between two spots uh, the idea is that when I see two dots at a distance in my visual field, I don't need to do any computation, I don't need to count the spots in between to know how far they are. I just have a feeling that they are at a distance that is either big or small. And all these things can be found in the relations between the distinctions in a cause of extraction. Now you are asking an interesting question which is, yeah, but what about the border of experience, of visual experience, of visual space? Well, in IIT terms, this can be translated into the question, can I find something in the cause effect structure of space that corresponds to yeah. the border of uh, visual space? And the answer is um, no, <laughs> because there is no border with, between, there's, no, there's nothing outside of visual space, right? It's not that I see a border between two areas. There is no such thing. Exactly. So it is very interesting, and I uh, definitely encourage you to read the the space paper I mentioned, because all these kind of uh, issues are 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 um, are discussed there. Uh, there's other interesting issues about, for instance, if you were to kill half of the visual cortex, then your visual space would shrink. And even though you were maybe able to still keep those neurons uh, firing and doing other things, for you in your experience, if the um, but for example, if you killed all the lateral connections between only half of the visual cortex, the neurons would still work as a map, but you wouldn't have an experience of that content, um, of that part of visual space, like if it was outside of the border. So all these kind of predictions are, are interesting and there's all plenty of thought experiments that can be done in terms of phenomenology. Uh, but again, yes, I just encourage you, I, I have to direct you to the paper because I, that's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah. Thanks Can I again, say one, one more thing? If anybody yeah. else had questions, uh, please feel free to email me. I'm very happy to answer your questions. My email is grasso2 at wisc.edu. Uh, so again, yes, it's here on the screen. Um, anytime. You can, yeah, there it is. Yeah, thanks again, Matteo. And Thank you. thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you. Matteo. Bye, everyone. Thank and you. See you all next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very bye. much. Ciao, Matteo. Presto. Ciao. Thanks so much for the talk. Bye. Ciao, Matteo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao Matteo.